You would think the GOP House Judiciary might have reconsidered this tweet, but nope, it's still up there. Kanye, Elon, Trump. And our panel is here, too. All right, Elon Musk is officially the chief twit. What's going to happen here, David? I don't think that anybody knows, but it feels ominous. And uh, I'm somebody who's covered this back in April when all of this started to happen. I had my hotel room booked in Delaware. I was getting ready for the trial that never happened. And um, I'm left with no understanding of what he wants to do with the site. So he's talked about being a free speech absolutist. We've seen that start, of, start to erode over these last couple of days. We've seen really bad signs today of who's been let back on and what the discourse is like. I wonder what he wants to do exactly, how fully he's embracing this role as chief twit, as you say, or the person who owns this $44 billion product, so much as it is one, and also just what it means for discourse in this country, going back to what we were talking about before. And I've been thinking a lot about something you wrote about in, in your last book, Anand, which is the role of these very wealthy individuals in our society who, by virtue of that, being successful, having a lot of money, feel imbued to make decisions, feel right in making those decisions about how our society should act and how we should communicate and deal with one another. And given That's what how much me about money they court. give to yes. lawmakers, they then are controlling so much of our government. What do we do about this? And even when you think, as people are panicked over Twitter, where has Congress been for all these years? As these platforms have become public square utilities, Congress has done nothing. And now we're all left at the whim of Elon Musk. I mean, this whole thing illustrates how American plutocracy functions, because this guy, Elon Musk, if, if you were to just write down like the three biggest strategic problems Twitter has as a platform that they have actually earnestly been trying to address, but not nearly enough, you talk about disinformation, yeah. you talk about just kind of bringing out the worst in all of us, and you talk about hate and not protecting the people who use your community from marginalized groups. And this is a guy who embodies those three problems. Yep. Like, he, he is what those problems look like yep. in the flesh. And so now the person who incarnates the problems is in charge of finding the search for solutions to the problems that he is. That's how this works, and that's how it's a closed loop. And the only answer to this is going to be real public force, as we have in the European Union. We can copy and paste a lot of what they've done, but we need to have a real public response to these companies. This mug is subject to way more federal regulation. It's not a joke. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. A ton more federal regulation, not to mention the water in it. Yes, it is. Than any of these software platforms. As tech long platforms. as we're talking about hate, we have to turn to Kanye. Obviously, Kanye West this week lost his billionaire status, lost oh, his contracts with sad. Adidas, yeah. with Gap. But here's one of the ugly truths. He has been saying awful, hateful, largely anti-black things for years. Sure. Where were we all these years? Because during those years is when he made all the, that money and right. signed those big deals. And I think that's the question that we should be asking. The question should be, Kanye didn't wake up and all of a sudden start spewing anti-Semitic remarks. And then from that point, we decided he's no longer welcome here. Your money's no good here. Kanye has been problematic in terms of his rhetoric for a very long time. He could walk out and say, well, slavery was a choice. And he gets rewarded with multi-million dollar contracts across a number of different industries. That requires us to take some more accountability. That requires us to look in the mirror and say, why is it that if he talks about this group, that we immediately sanction him? But when he talked about these other groups over here, we kind of sort of let it ride. We didn't like it. I mean, none of us liked it, but we allowed it. And I think that that in and of itself is an interesting conundrum because now that he is being punished, as he has talked about certain groups, in some ways, unfortunately, it proves our point. Or it proves his point, rather. Mm. The other thing that I want to say is that I think that Kanye is the great miscalculator. And what I mean by that is I think that mm. he took a calculated risk in his mind as to what he was going to lose by going into this battle, if you will, with the different companies that he was aligned with. He wanted out of those contracts. We know that. He was very mm -hmm. public about that. And he realized, this is the nuclear option, and I'm going to take it. His miscalculation wasn't necessarily what he was going to lose. I believe that his miscalculation is much more connected to his ability or what he thought was his ability to regain it. That's why you saw him show up at Skechers and get turned away. He thought, look, I'm going to be able to fix this because I'm Kanye West, and now he's getting another answer and another story. Okay, well, he's being rightfully punished, but he's not the only one who spews hate. Sure. Take Donald Trump, take Tucker Carlson, take Marjorie Taylor Greene, and what do they get? More money, more power. How do you solve for that? I mean, that's a big question. I think that 
again, this is a fight for our lives and a fight for our democracy, and everything comes back to the disinformation war and doing what Anand do, does when I see him on Twitter, which is to constantly be fighting that and not to equivocate and to be talking constantly about the things that are true, that are correct, that are not alternative facts. And we have to use that and use all of our collective platforms to keep that narrative going and to keep fighting it at every turn because there's no other way to stop it from happening because the war will keep shifting towards that. Everything will keep shifting in that direction if we are not if we are not talking about the ways in which we are complicit with it and also talking about how to change it. I do want to say one thing in Kanye's defense. Um, this week, in an interview, he revealed that he has never read a book. And so I Period. think... Period? Yeah, yeah, he said he, he thinks books are like Brussels sprouts, and he's, yeah. never, he's never read one. And um, so because he's ignorant, we should embrace him? No, I, I, I think... Because he's got so all the time doing, in the world to read In one. so doing, he has revealed an important PSA. Like, we do, like, an NBC, The More You Know. Do, do, do. Avoid, <laughs> avoid becoming Kanye. You know. Read books. <laughs> I think the danger in these that, though, two have two new ones out for you. I, I, you know, I think the danger in that though is we are, you know, Kanye's brand of brashness is easily an emotional violence that is inflicted upon all of us, but specifically certain cross sections of community. The danger is there are people who are just as ignorant, if not more, who are actually enacting physical violence against vulnerable people across the country who are defenseless, and that sort of thinking can be perverted to allow it to just wallow in their own ignorance. And in the meantime, people like Kanye are relatively still shielded by way of their station in life from the actual effects of that. Mm -hmm. But on the ground, in community, there are people who are literally going to be affected by that. We saw it at Speaker Pelosi's house, right? Like, that's an example of how ignorance left unfettered and just said, yeah, they're ignorant. And I know that that's not what you're saying. I'm saying to the viewers... I'm saying you made a great advertisement for <laughs> yeah, absolutely. and reading. There are, there are tons of them, and we have to double down on that message because there are still people who are talking about his brilliance. And you can be incredibly gifted in one lane, but at the same time be incredibly problematic in another. And I think that that's the dichotomy of Kanye West that we have to settle on. David, last point to you. To bring it full circle, I mean, these are two very different individuals, but what they have done is they've felt wronged. They think that they're funny and provocative, both Elon Musk and Kanye West. And their impulse, uh, when society pushes against them, is to spend billions of dollars, or I don't know how much parlor costs, but to buy the social media platform for themselves. And I think that that says so much about where we're at, that the impulse isn't to think about how they've acted or what they've done or how that might be egregious. It's instead to use the money that they've made to buy a platform that exists and shape it in the image that they want it to be. Listen, we know how dangerous this rhetoric is. We saw it this morning with Paul Pelosi. We can only hope that there's going to be dialing back, but the truth is, there's not. There's not unless we take action and be the agents of change and live in a stronger, smarter, better world. Thank you to our Friday night, Friday night cap panel, Anand Girdadas, Amber Tamblyn, Charles Coleman, David Gura. On that note, I wish all of you a very good night. And from all of our colleagues across the networks of NBC News, thanks for staying up late with us. I will see you on Monday night.